so we're just gonna deal with it. No, and I got some weird lighting too, so it's fine. It's fine, but we got a great background. Thanks, David. Yep. Looks great. <laughs> He's got the hand up in there. Also, uh, I apologize if through the midst of this recording you hear Sam in the background going, ba 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 because he's just really talkative, right? <laughs> Ida is has been asleep for over an hour. Nice. It's teething. She's yeah. she's like 6 p.m. She's like, let's go to bed. Mm. <laughs> and then she sleeps most of the night. So we're like, well, just keep putting her to bed. Anyway, that's parenting for you, podcast listeners. If Sorry. you're not a parent, you'll you'll understand it later. Um, it's a parent episode today. Woo! On Hufflepuff the show of requirements. Parents. Hufflepuff <laughs> parents. Um, not pet parents. We're real parents. Spencer. I'm so sorry. This is kind of podcast related, but speaking of wizarding parents, um, Sam's sorting. Welcome to the show of requirement, Harry Potter podcast, exclusively everywhere. Oh yes, that's continue. True. Um, Sam's sorting ceremony is happening this Friday. Okay. And I'm excited because he'll be nine and three quarters <laughs> months old. <laughs> oh, very nice. Um, I'm gonna wait until Ida's nine and three quarters years old. Fair. <laughs> just kidding i don't know but i bought little onesies i you know we'll see what so, happens I don't, he's not showing through... a preference for any colors except for maybe orange right now so i'm not really sure where that's gonna go <laughs> ida would definitely go for the red thing um i know that so that's why we won't be having the sorting <laughs> i he's not showing too much preference i'm hoping that maybe maybe it'll be even i don't Again, we're doing this just for fun, um, but eventually he will come into his own state of mind and thinking and be able to sort himself. So, you know. Yeah. What part of this party is Voldemort going to come in and go, we will no longer have sorting at Hogwarts and then <laughs> set the sorting hat on fire. <laughs> we'll tape someone's nose down. <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. Anyway, it's it's Spencer and Abby, guys. Um, no cold. No, David, but I'm back. So it's a and Abby's returned. So I feel like it's been a while since we've had just two people on the podcast. I know, but I was like, I'm not going to be here next week. And then I'll be back after that. But I will be gone next week. So I was like, I just, we got to get this one in. Yeah, you know, I got to, I got to play my part in this part of Deathly Hollows and then I'll come back later. <laughs> um, and this might be a little bit of a scatterbrained episode because we are both parents of uh, infants. So um, we're just making it happen, guys. Ooh. That being said, <laughs> I feel a little ashamed of this. Right when we finished Half-Blood Prince, I didn't want to wait even a second. And I happened to have downloaded the audiobook for Deathly Hollows. So I may or may not have listened to the entire thing before we even, because of my long commute, before we even actually started Deathly Hollows. And so then I went back when I knew I was going to be hosting. I went back and listened to last week's episode. I have things to address, <laughs> but I also started again. So it might be scatterbrained, but also I think I have the book memorized by now. There you go. That is helpful because I got ahead of myself right after we finished and read the first 13 chapters. Mm. Like Chapter the 11 week is after. fantastic. Um, um, but we will not be I, talking about that. I didn't go back. Um, so it may take me a minute to catch back up to remember what happened. And, um, okay. my OCD hates me for it. Um, undiagnosed, but we are going to continue David's, uh, style of chapter of five chapters at a time. And I'll tell you why <laughs> listeners it's because it's because the, the book is 35 ish chapters. And so we can do five chapter sections. There's a lot more to unpack in this book anyway. Okay. And we'll, we'll just do six chapters at the end because no one cares about the epilogue. Maybe I said it. I said it. Um, <laughs> the epilogue's not not my favorite thing. Anyway, uh, we're on chapters five through ten. Chapter five is the ghoul in pajamas. It's titles, chapter titles that really the first time reading this don't have no idea what it's going to be about 
and then through chapter 10 creature's tale which is a tearjerker yes um but to address things from last week uh i could not for the life of me figure out where i had heard his name being pious thickensy i thought no, it was the I movies you're right though because i feel like i've heard it that way too i've i've heard it that way i don't have a preference frankly i think thickness is more funny jim dale definitely says thickness mm -hmm. i could not find stephen fry but my thought is it has to be stephen fry Maybe. because the movies do not say his name other than pious right um he also is, <laughs> pious is also murdered by voldemort for no reason in the movie because <laughs> he just wants Fair. to see he thinks the elder wand's not working so he just turns around kills the nearest death eater to him which happens to be by his thickness yeah. um poor poor bloke i, I yep. read apparently he was a gryffindor and then the imperious curse just kind of threw everything off and but he didn't die in the books so there's that um there's other things oh Harry's wand. Um, Harry's wand acting of its own accord. That is actually established later in the book. Um, why that happens. In fact, King's Cross chapter has a lot more exposition than I remember. Mm -hmm. It kind of is like, explain everything. Um, and so the movie one is great, but the book actually explains a lot more and actually also explains why Harry survived again which the movie kind of is like, they kind of just brushed over that, which I think we're we'll have to talk to today because I think the movie is a very faithful adaptation, but it's, it's somehow both faithful to the meanings and the nuances and stuff more than the, the other movies are, but it also does not follow every single detail mm -hmm. that the book does. And so I think it's, it's technically those movies are technically not the most faithful adaptation of a book of a Harry Potter book. I would probably lend that to chamber of secrets just because it's the longest and really doesn't skip a single thing except the ghost party. <laughs> True. The only thing, the only thing they left out was the death day party. Like every other single thing is included. Um, while this one is like pretty much following every single beat because it has two movies to do it. Um, but then they're like, let's just have Harry and Voldemort shoot the, we'll just have them do the lightning bolt thing again. Let's just do that again. Let's just do it every time. Yeah. And not, don't explain it. Just do it. <laughs> so I feel like there was some golden flames, but nothing, nothing crazy. Um, also, David said Elpheus Dodge like a madman. And I just think that needs to be established. I don't remember what the other, there was another thing that I wanted to bring up from last week's episode, but that one just fueled me. He was giving, I was getting so much flack. I wasn't even I, I also, and David, and now to be fair, do I know how to say his name? No. And maybe David's saying it right. But as soon as he said it, I was like, I don't think that's how you say his name. The actor who plays Voldemort. Oh yeah. Ray Fiennes. Rafe finds David definitely said, said Ralph, Ralph. That <laughs> which made me laugh. <laughs> I don't. And I don't. I think... guess we're taking turns. Whoever's not in the episode just gets roasted. Um, and David said defense, the last name wrong too, though. He said Fianus or something. Yeah. Um, in David's defense, he was saying both of those how it is spelled. It's true. Now I couldn't remember how it was spelled. Typically, what I have to do. Is like I'll look at how it's spelled and I know it's not said how it's spelled and then I can remember how to say it, but half the time I don't remember how it's spelled. And so I go, oh, what's his name again? And I always get him confused with another actor too. But that's a whole nother thing. Oh, I remember the fourth thing. They were talking you guys got into a sidebar about Grindelwald versus Voldemort. And oh, you said yeah. Grindelwald beats Voldemort every time. Um I don't know. I feel like they were trying to make Grindelwald scary, and so they made it so where he can just destroy wands. Right. And that, I, I think if Voldemort could do, I think if Grindelwald could do that, so could Voldemort. 
Uh, it's kind I of. I think a... I just don't know what prime Voldemort is like. I don't think know? we do. And so I think it's hard to say which one's better, Prime Voldemort or Prime Grindelwald, because I don't know much about Prime Voldemort because we didn't see him. I don't think we really even know much about Prime no. Grindelwald. Um, That's fair. We know that he event inevitably loses. So what I was, my thought process was less that and more that Dumbledore has to be the most powerful character in the universe. Like he has to beat both of them because. Dumbledore beat some beat the rightful owner of the Elder Wand, which is supposed to be impossible. Yeah. So, I mean, he lost. But I would that would be kind of how I finish that argument. It's just they might not. They might be pretty close, but Dumbledore is better in both of them. So, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't know what these balloons are for. <laughs> um, I did this. I don't know. Oh, you had a little thumb come up. A new piece. Oh, if this does this make balloons? <laughs> okay, the recording software we're using does interesting things for the YouTubers. When I do a thumbs up, oh, it's, it's not going to do it. It only does it when I don't mean it to. <laughs> uh, Anyway, sorry, listeners. Sorry, p- p- audio only listeners. <laughs> chapter chapter five, the ghoul in pajamas. See, he's me. Yeah, I totally forgot about the ghoul. And like Not most of lie. these, and like most of these chapters, there's so many things going on other than the ghoul in pajamas. It's really true. That was only like a yeah. brief portion of this chapter well and that's every every deathly hallows chapter i feel like is a a million things um but uh ron does give harry this prediction about mrs weasley um and mrs weasley corners him and i i just do you think abby as the as the resident mom of the podcast is Mrs. Weasley's motivation like what what do you think about her approach here? I think she's feeling so you know how Mrs. Weasley is. Like she wants to feel like she's kind of in control, knowing full well though, like Fred and George are their own beast. She's never really fully been in control of her kids. But I think she likes knowing what's going on with her children and in like their lives. And this is just a part where now she's not getting any information. And I think that makes her nervous, especially with in previous books, it's the last book, Ron almost died. And well, the book, well, in this book, Fred almost died. Well, almost all of her family members died because, you know, getting Harry there was a disaster. But then Ron almost died in the last book. Mr. Weasley almost died in the book before. Ginny almost died in book two. Um, Ron, you know, was injured in book three. I just think that her family just always seems like they're in a constant state of potential danger. And so she wants to have a good idea of what's going on. And it makes her nervous when she doesn't know. I would say that everyone but Ginny was in risk of death because of their involvement with the order in chamber of secrets case Ginny was just making adolescent mistakes yes and harry saved her but in all the other ones it could be argued that because they were fighting on dumbledore and harry's side Mm -hmm. they got on the chopping block as it were well and i think up Um, to this point she's been kept in the loop on the order's activities And has been in control of, like, who knows what, especially within her family. So for her to be the person now not knowing what's going on, I think is scary Uh, for her. 100%. Yeah. And uh, it's just frustrating. Yeah. Um, And and you love Mrs. Weasley, but then she feels overbearing in this chapter. And then you're like, why? But I don't know. I kind of get it as a mom. But it still makes me be like... 
back off, Molly. <laughs> yeah, and it's tough that's like me and Arthur have a right to know. I'm like, ye maybe. Because they're not I guess they are of age, but uh in this in the wizarding world. Yep. And I would but I would want to know where my seventeen year olds were going. Exactly. And especially if I knew that it had the potential to be dangerous. And of course, she doesn't seem to know about Hermione's parents. No. Either. Which we're going to have to talk about that this chapter, too. Um, Yeah. uh, This is where we get the fun reference. Some people will care about this, but most people won't. Um, This is all that we know about Harry's affiliations with professional Quidditch. Yes. That's not mine. I don't support... (laughs) Puddlemere United. Rowling could have at least given us a team. <laughs> we supposed. know it's not Puddlemere. Oh, when we're talking about pronunciations, we have to establish this as well. Jim Dale, in all of his glory, has made a mistake oh, in no. pronunciation that he corrected. Oh. And David's not going to believe this. He's going to have to go and fact check this. And maybe... You, David's going to find an argument out of this. In Half Blood Prince, Jim Dale is speaking as Slughorn, and he says, Gwynog Jones, captain of the Holy Head Harpies. And then in this book, he says, captain of the Holly Head Harpies, which is the correct pronunciation. Mm-hmm. I think David would argue that's a Slughorn thing, but I would argue that I was that it's about a Jim to Dale ask mistake. if that was a, a Jim Dale mistake or if that was a he was having Slughorn pronounce it. Interestingly, it was like deliberate, like too much holy, yeah. holy head harpies. But anyway, it's fine. But all we know is Harry not Harry doesn't support Puddlemere United. Dumbledore does. Fun fact. We know that. Well, if Dumb- Dumbledore's about it, we're, you know. I was going to say, I feel like I have to support Puddlemere United. I mean, I can't <laughs> support the Chudley Cannons. I mean, that's obvious. I've already forgotten which team I supported in our Quidditch I know. episode. I know. I, can't I can tell either. you, if I see the uniform, I can oh. tell you which one it was. It was the Bats. I was the Bats. Hold on. Hold on. What are the... I don't know. You could tell me what the bats are while I move us forward. Move us along. Um, this is a... These are the chapters where... And it's probably good that Cole's not... Cole's sick because this would have made him sick anyway. Um, it gets a little bit... We get a little bit of sauce between Harry and Ginny in these chapters. A little bit of sauce. A little bit of sauce. Um, and we need to talk about that. I don't know if this is his birthday chapter or it's the next one. But Harry and Ginny are doing chores and um, they're talking about mom. Uh, Ginny's talking about her mom. And then Harry says, and then what does she think is going to happen? Harry muttered, someone else might kill off Voldemort while she's holding us here making volavants. He had spoken without thinking and saw Ginny's face whiten. So it's true, she said. That's what you're trying to do. I, not, I was joking, said Harry evasively. They stared at each other, and there was something more than shock in Ginny's expression. Suddenly, Harry became aware that this was the first time they had been alone with her since those stolen hours in secluded corners of the Hogwarts grounds. He was sure she was remembering them, too. Both of them jumped as the door opened. A little sauce. Just a little sauce. And I think... (laughs) <laughs> the fan fiction people take it way too far. But this is good. This is good. It's just enough for me. It's just some tension. And then the, and then lets off the tension again. There you go. It's good. It's good. Um, also, it's a great... I don't know if it's a pun. I don't know if it's a pun on purpose. But Voldemort and Volavance. It's really good stuff. <laughs> um, I have I beef with this. Pride of Portrait. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Uh, okay, so the the Fidelius charm might be my favorite and least favorite thing of Harry Potter. It's just 
and a fandom done right reference it's jack sparrow's compass of this universe like it it makes so many convenient plot points um but then it doesn't also it also doesn't hold up on its own logic so arthur is explaining that the charm no longer works because dumbledore died and so everybody that he told the secret to became the secret keeper which is fine i guess um, and then there's a tongue tying curse, so hair, so Snape can't speak of Grimald Place. Is that a, just a trick around the Fidelius charm? I guess. Yeah. Uh, it seems like they're just taking a big risk to be at Grimald Place. But I guess Snape also wouldn't have told people about it because he's still on the good side. But we don't know that yeah, right but, now. But they don't know that. So. Yeah. But anyway. And then they exp they go through a great amount of detail explaining the Fidelius charm with um, Harry Harry's parents and how they made the secret keeper Peter Pettigrew. And then later in this book, and we're skipping around, but it's fine. Shell Cottage is a Fidelius charm protected, and Bill is secret keeper, which means that. And then they also do another Fidelius charm when they all go to Aunt Muriel's and Arthur becomes secret keeper, which means this entire time James could have just been the secret keeper. Of their house. Um, How could James have been the secret keeper? James could have been the secret keeper for his own house. Oh. Because Bill was secret keeper for his own house and Arthur's secret keeper for his own house. Mm-hmm. That's fair. So it doesn't really hold up. Yeah. And you could argue that James, you, could, you can't recon it. Not for lack of trying from JK, probably. But <laughs> there's no putting it back in the bottle. But... Yeah. James could have been secret keeper. And if he had told Peter Pettigrew, then Peter Pettigrew could have told someone else. No, that doesn't work. It has to come straight from the secret keeper, I guess. But then, but then Ron brought everyone to shell cottage and he's not the secret keeper. Right. Yeah. This, I don't know that we're going to make sense of it in this episode. No, no I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think I will in future episodes either. No. But I just, if there's listeners that are reading with us or listeners that just happen to be finding this episode after reading, be like, are they going to talk about the Fidelius charm? There, we did. You're welcome. Sad about Mad Eye Moody. Yeah. <laughs> and this is just a funny moment, but. Uh, Mrs. Weasley's like, now, Ron, you have to have your room cleaned out. Why haven't you cleaned it out yet? He's like, why? Why does my room I have to be cleaned gonna out? I know you're going to mention this. Because, well, because I like what he says. Um, we're holding your brother's wedding here in a few days' time. They're getting married in my bedroom? No, so why in the name of Merlin's saggy left? <laughs> Don't talk to your mother like that. <laughs> this is like, this is the book of all of the Merlin-related swearers. And I think it's so funny. I don't know why. <laughs> JK decided to do that. <laughs> I'm mad because none of I made a great meme and it was just too early. I think you guys hadn't started reading yet. Probably. I made a meme. It's I'm gonna post it on the Instagram, I think, but it's the Drake meme where he's like, no, and then yes. And the no is someone saying Merlin's beard, and then the yes is someone saying Merlin's pants. Yep. <laughs> and apparently it gets into Merlin's. Probably Merlin's genitalia as well. Oh, no, I did laugh at that one. Um, oh, good. Okay. It I was, was a while like, back. I think I remember it. Merlin's I pants. I like the Drake meme, though. They all say Merlin's pants in this one, pretty much. And then um, I do like that they do curse, but they don't say what they're cursing about. So there's a part later where Ron's complaining about his tight jeans and Hermione gives, it says Hermione gave him his muttered a suggestion of where he could stick his wand. Mm -hmm. That was like really good stuff. Yep. Really hilarious stuff. 
they honestly you have to have some this book is i don't know this book i don't think is the darkest out of all of them but it I kind of is like, though yeah <clears throat> i don't yeah i feel like you just really need some humor laced through it and you JK. know before you jumped on the call someone with one of the reviews was talking about that this is the darkest and the funniest mm -hmm. and, and maybe that's, that's what it is is like i think it's true because of the humor it makes it feel a little bit lighter and i forget about how dark it is whereas some of the other books just feel heavy because there's not as much humor in it oh not not dark they said this is the saddest of the harry potter books but it's also the funniest oh it's for sure the saddest book um, that's by Lev, so many people Lev, die. Lev Grossman of Time Magazine. Mm. Thanks, Lev. If that's your how your name's pronounced. Um goodness, they went they do go dark here though at points. And I think it's just 17 year olds just having no filter whatsoever. Yeah. Ron and him, Harry are talking about um Mad Eye Moody its body and they're like oh the death theaters probably got it and then yeah said harry like barty crouch turned to a bone and then buried it in hedrick's front garden they probably transfigured moody and stuffed him hermione's like don't hermione <laughs> cries a lot in this section um and that's because they're just they just put hermione through the ringer it's not hermione's fault no she just keeps ending up in these terrible terrible conversations Oh, and then uh, I love Jim Dale for this. Um, Harry, Harry starts trying to talk them out of, try to talk them out of going with him again. Um, and Jim Dale goes, here he goes. Ron said to Hermione, rolling his eyes, as we knew he would. She sighed, turning back to the books. Like he doesn't <laughs> like a singy, songy thing. And uh -huh. thought, mm, just really good stuff. And they just full on ignore him. Like, you know, I think I will take Hogwarts of history. <laughs> Listen, no, Harry, you listen. This was decided months ago, years really. But, um, ugh. yeah, I, I don't know. I think I like, I think the movie has to get some props for this of opening with Hermione obliviating yeah. her own parents. I think that this it sets the tone, you know, the movie just really hits you. And I yeah. think I still stand that my weird opinion and I'm after, we're going to do an episode on this in the future, I think, but Deathly Hollows part one is the only Harry Potter movie that is better than the book mm. is what I, as how I feel about it, except for a few scenes. Um, there's some exceptions to the rule, but I think that's something where it adds to the narrative. Mm. Um, although it bothers me and the movie doesn't make this mistake. But obviously she has to mess, she has to use Obliviate to mess with her parents' memories. Um, she modified their memories, which apparently is not the same as wiping their memories. But then later in this, she's messing with it. They're trying to figure out what to do with the Death Eaters. And she's like, oh, I've never done it before, but I understand the theory. And I'm like, you have done it before. You just did this. <laughs> right. To your own parents. She forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but Harry, I just, the, the ghoul in the jam is just, oh boy. Also, I don't know what Spattergroit is, but I don't think I'd ever want it. Well, it's a wizard disease, just like dragon pox. Right. Which I was thankful one of you looked that up. That's that's my role of the podcast, though. I would have been able to tell you. Yep. That's how Harry's grandparents died. Yeah. And yes, it was convenient, listeners. <laughs> I yes. know. You don't have to tell me twice. Um, and Cole made a great point. But anyway. <laughs> I love that Hermione's like, show him, Ron. He's like, no, he's just eaten. And then they go up there and Ron's like, yeah, but let's head down before I talk about it. I think I'm going to be sick. <laughs> um, it works, though. You know, it saves Ron's family and they really thought about it. Yeah. If you are a big Harry Potter fan, you'll enjoy all of the um, all of the book titles are good. And all of the mm -hmm. book titles are references from previous books like Break with a Banshee is a is a Gildory Lockhart book. Uh, Defensive Magical Theory. I think that I want to say that's 
um, Mad Eye Moody or Lupin. Ron's just Ron's just really grabbing for straws, and I love that about him. He's like, "What if Mad Eye's still alive?" He's not. <laughs> what if What if Rab already destroyed the Horcrux? <laughs> Like yeah, but we still have to. <laughs> he didn't. We still have to. Con- <laughs> we still have to confirm. Um, right. Can you imagine if they did this whole thing, faced off with Voldemort, and come to find out they missed one? <laughs> that's a Ron Weasley thing to do. Yeah. And I know he's smarter than we give him credit for, but that is something Book Ron would also would definitely do. <laughs> um, I think her. I think Dumbledore's uh spell keeping the books from being uh, summoned was attached to his life. Kind of like the freezing charm with Harry Mm. that or Dumbledore was like, it was one of those, like, it's so, it's so dumb. It's brilliant. Like you'd never think of that being the way to get the thing, but that is the thing that works. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I just started thinking, I don't know. That reminded me, in the last episode, I didn't bring this up, but I thought it was funny that Harry tried to Accio Hagrid. <laughs> I never think about using Accio on people, but he was like, Accio Hagrid. <laughs> like, is that going to work? I don't know. Oh, is it Accio? I feel like it's Accio, but then Jim Dale says Accio. I don't know. I, don't know. I say Accio. I thought they yeah. say Accio in the movies. They do. I was about to say the same thing. They say Accio in the movies. It's the everything's the movie's fault, but we love them for it anyway. <laughs> JK I love didn't every, fix I love it. So, uh, how in the name of Merlin's pants have you managed to get your hands on those Horcrux books? <laughs> Just Merlin's pants again. Uh, they finally they actually go through the process of explaining all of uh, the 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 rules of Horcruxes. Mm-hmm. Which and I think why is the nice. Basilic Fang works. Um, how a Horcrux is the opposite of a human being, and somehow I think just I think it's so genius because Horcrux is such a terrible thing, but listening to it explained by Hermione nullifies the the blow a little bit, where she's just explaining how it is. Yeah, um, it just doesn't make it feel so bad. But if like Slughorn was explaining it again, it'd be like, oof, it's a little mm-hmm. gross. It's a little dark stuff. Um, I'm also, this it's... is just another like props to JK. Like I, uh, maybe it's just, I'm not a very creative human being, but like coming up with something like a Horcrux, being able to name it, come up with how it works, what it is in general, and being able to just, it, and it's not just Horcruxes. She did it for this entire series, creating this world, like and determining like world building and how the magical wizarding world works. And I'm just like, how do you do that? And naming yeah, and everything. I feel like, like I feel like she had an idea of how Horcruxes, but she didn't have all the final details when she wrote the first book and mm-hmm. the second book, and like especially Chamber of Secrets. And so it's wild that she was able to kind of pull it all I back know. together. It feels like you're Um, BSing an entire series of books until you get to the end and you're like, ah, that's where it was going. Okay. I got it. (laughs) And it's like, I know it's too smart to be BSing. There's no no way. I know. There's no way the plane would have landed. Right. And we're going to have to get into it. But King's cross 80% of why Harry doesn't die. That time is because of goblet of fire. And I don't know if that feels a little bit more like BSing, but dang, it's good BSing. Um, <laughs> but yes, um, that's the one small problem I have with the movie is they go through a whole scene of trying to destroy the Horcrux that they've just gotten when they've already explained that none of those things will work. Right. And Hermione understands that. And so it's kind of like, come on, movie Hermione. What are you doing? Why are we doing this? Also, I am recognizing that we are still in the first chapter of this section and it's been half an hour. So we probably need to get rolling. 
We have babies. Oh gosh, there's just so much stuff going on in this chapter. Anyway, uh, the Delacours arrive for the wedding. Gorgovich, the Quidditch player. No, not him. <laughs> Harry's Harry's seventeen. Mm -hmm. Um, which is great. Uh, slick, sort of Ron. I just love that Ron gives him the book about charming girls, and it's like, oh, he's like, it's not just wand work either. Yeah, it's freaking compliments. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I love that he just gives compliments to everyone, and then Harry gives a compliment to Miss Weasley, and she's like, oh, thank you. And Ron's mouthing behind him, good like, one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Um, but yes, the I, the Delacours are actually fun and awesome. Yeah. Um, really good stuff. We, um, we got to talk about the sauce, Abby. <laughs> Can't skip the sauce on me. Uh, no. <laughs> and the movie just is so weird. The movie version of this scene. No, it was, was funny. It's kind of cringy and. Um, no, okay. Their their interaction was super cringy. George coming yes. in was funny. Yes, morning. Yep. But you are but, right. Their interaction was super cringe. When you watch um, it. this one's just like, geez, this is this is some this is some hot, steamy stuff. Um, where um, they actually get to see. I feel like we learn a lot of Ginny's character very quickly. Um, which is what I appreciate about it, because Ginny's like one of my favorite side characters in the series. Um, it was small but bright. There was a large poster of the Wizarding Band, the Weird Sisters, a uh, picture of Gwynog Jones, um, looking over the orchard. And Ginny's, Ginny's just trying to talk to Harry, and he's trying to like not look at her because they're still in love. Um Ginny was not tearful. This was one of that was one of the many wonderful things about Ginny. She was rarely weepy. Um, I think he's, she's like, I'd like to have something you remember me by. You know, if you met some Velo when you're off doing whatever you're doing, <laughs> I think dating opportunities are going to be pretty thin on the ground. To be honest, are we in chapter seven now? Yeah, did okay. I skip a chapter? No, you just we. I didn't know when we transitioned. Yeah, we did. Cool. Uh, the Will of Albus Dumbledore, which the chapter is mostly not about the Will of Albus Dumbledore, but, it's... Mm, but that's how it goes. Um, and but, Ron's yeah. protective big brother. Oh, uh, Ron's the worst. Um, but at the same, well, I would say Ron's the worst, but then at the same time, Ron is actually really defensive of Ginny's. Um, like he said, she was really torn up when he broke up with her, and he and all these things. And so he's actually in the rights kind of sense of mind this time, I feel like. Yeah. Um, gosh. But yeah, Ro Hermione's still like, Ron! <laughs> um, also, Harry got the wand from Fabian Pruitt, which they reference a few more times in the book, but it's just a cool gift to get. It's a cool in-universe thing. Um, also, is this like... The first birthday party Harry's gotten to have? I don't think so. I think they have little birthday parties for Harry and he's at the borough and uh, Half Blood Prince. They talk about a birthday dinner or something mm -hmm. there, I think. And then okay. he is at um, Grimald Place, I think, for his birthday in the fifth one. Okay. I couldn't remember, but when I was looking at this... It's was, a little more brushed over than this one is. Well, they were just describing how there were so many people there that they placed, like, a long number of tables. I was just imagining, like, a whole bunch of tables and just people sitting, like, all the people he loved just sitting at these tables, just celebrating him for his birthday. And I was like, what a sweet thing for Harry to experience after having lived with the Dursleys for so long. Uh, Norbert's Norberta, but yeah. I want to talk about we get um, so we get like a kind of double. It's I don't know. It's like a companion scene to Half Blood Prince when Scrimger shows up with Percy and Scrimger showing up with Arthur in this one. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have to. I have to ask the question again: Is Harry in the right? 
for not siding with Scrimger. Especially because he was killed the next day. Yeah. And I feel like the order is almost order of the Phoenix almost works against the Ministry of Magic before it falls. Mm-hmm. And so it's just like really frustrating to me because I understand that Scrimger didn't um step up for Dumbledore and Harry in Order of the Phoenix, the book, when they were telling the truth. But also he would have lost his job if he did that. Right. Um, and the head of the order office is not... It's a high level in the ministry, but the head of magical law enforcement is actually above the order office. And so he had somebody above him. And he kind of superseded that for for minister and so he came in at a horrible time and oh, so yeah. i just i understand i kind of understand harry's motivations and and scrimger just not really having a sensitive sensitivity to um harry and his struggles um but at the same time i don't know maybe this is very liberal of me but i feel like if Harry had actually gone with the, them to some extent, to any extent, uh, supported the ministry, then maybe it wouldn't have fallen and maybe things would have been different. Yeah. Um, I know they're still, they were still holding Stan Shunpike in the 6-1. Uh, I know they had thrown people in Azkaban and stuff, but it's like, if they just worked together, the full bite of the ministry is pretty great when the Death Eaters have it. Maybe it would have been nice when the Order of the Phoenix could have had it as well. Mm-hmm. It's just not not the best writing right. for me. Um, poor Scrimger is all I'm going to say about that. Yeah. Bill Nye is great. And the will, I mean... I don't have much to say about this. I mean, it's mm. just the they all get the things... I think the movie scene is actually more interesting. I agree with that. Um, and that's Bill Nye. That's just Bill Nye being great. Not not really anything in particular. Um, yeah, that's that's the movie just left out Scrimger entirely from Half Blood Prince. Just yeah. rushed over that detail. Um, but I do like when Ron is like, uh, he's talking about like Dumbledore. He's like me, not really. It was always Harry who. Uh, Ron looked around at Harry and Hermione to see Hermione giving him a stop talking now kind of look, but the damage was done. <laughs> You're being modest, Ron, said Hermione. Dumbledore was very fond of you. This was stretching the truth to breaking point. <laughs> and uh, 100%. Uh, but Hermione's mean to Scrimger. She does not hold back. She's definitely gotten... Yeah. Um, she's definitely gotten a lot more of her her Gryffindor qualities, Mm -hmm. you know, in this book. Um, She laughed derisively at the Minister of Magic. That's such a Gryffindor thing to do. (laughs) Oh, it can't be a reference to the fact that Harry's a great seeker. That'd be way too obvious. There must be a secret message from Dumbledore hidden in the icing. I feel like, I feel like that's Ron also influencing her a bit too, Mm -hmm. I think. That's a Ron. Ron, I mean, the snitch did open. (laughs) So... Yeah, he wasn't wrong. Um, I think I think there's somewhere in this where they talk about how Hermione just has this utter need to answer every single question. Um, but yeah, they definitely. Um, it's time. It's not too up to a 17 year old boy to tell me how to do my job. It's time you learn some respect. It's time you earned it, said Harry. Mm. Goodness. Yep. But I think that's really. Uh, I mean, they, yeah, that's it. Uh, the wedding. wedding. Cousin Barney. Real Forgot quick. Harry Real yeah. quick. Polyjuiced Harry or just Harry as himself in the movie? Which one? Which one did you like better? I think I liked just Harry as himself. I think it makes more sense for the scene. And yeah. it it kind of overhauls the... Uh, Elpheus Doge 
and Auntie Muriel talking to Harry, it just all makes more sense with Auntie Muriel being like, honestly, did you know the man at all? Yeah. Uh, Victor Crumb's there. He's in the movie in a deleted scene, but they get all they get into that a little bit more in the book, but nothing crazy. This season, um, Ophelia's love good. Yeah, I like movies in Ophelia's more than the book. He's a little more like he. The book kind of describes him like he's ninety million years old, um, while the movie makes a more sensible mm-hmm. parent. Um, gosh, it's tough to be built. I think. I think it's hard to hear the balance of the Dumbledore and there's the Rita Skeeter story and there's um, what Dumbledore told him maybe. And then there's um, Alpheus Stoge's story and like all difficult to find truths. The truth is actually somewhere in the middle right. as we learned from Aberforth later in the book. Uh I always hear the movie now. The the, the line with uh, Kingsley Shacklebolt. Oh, Mystery yes. has fallen. Scrimgeour is dead. dead. They are coming. I think that was brilliant. I don't know. I think stuff. I think it was good. The movie uh, did a place great to job. Hide. Again, the movie the movie's just I love the Deathly Hallows Part One movie. And I yeah. might be the only one. I feel a like honestly the movie like got this part, I think, pretty. Oh yeah, Tanya on. Court Road. Like I don't even I, really. I guess my thing is Harry should be wearing the invisibility cloak all the crew all the freaking time. That is true. But also, you can't Tottenham make a movie. You can't make a good movie. You can't make a good movie. Yeah. With Harry in an invisibility cloak, the whole movie. No, that makes it difficult. Um. And I love that Hermione's like, it's the first thing that popped in my head. And then later in the book, when they land somewhere, um, Harry just finishes, it's the first thing that popped into your head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whenever they separate. Um, I like Ron just, uh, just like the, the book, Ron's like, oh my god, this is disgusting. <laughs> They're running to Roland Dollahoff. Yep. Uh, the the movie's dining. fun. I think the movie's oh, yeah. better. Uh, gosh, Hermione just splits open Ron's knee. Yeah. Um, she gets stronger at dueling, and I think the, I think the movie did the right thing in giving her a little more cred to that, because I think Hermione should be able to duel better than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, they go to Grimald Place. Severus Snape. Mm-hmm. That's how Jim Dale does it every single time. Just funny. Uh, gosh, I don't think there's much else to mention from a place to hide. No. Uh, yeah. The Patronus magic thing is very cool, though. It's a very yes. fun piece of magic. Yep. All right. Last chapter. Creature's Tale. Not that we have any time to cover this. Um, I'm mad that the movie doesn't spend enough time talking through that whole story. I agree. Um, I also, and I, I, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention it. I know we're out of time, but Harry does go into Sirius's room in the movie, but he does not find the letter. And I think that adds such a personal touch, touch. that I'm upset that we didn't get in the movie. Yeah, and Harry's just really touched by this letter, and he she yeah. makes the G's the same way he does, and uh, it's literally days before they were killed. Um, well, he has yeah. something that his mom touched, you know, yeah. that she wrote on. It was something of his mother's. And I feel like that whole letter was just to establish that Dumbledore had the visibility cloak. Yeah, but she added in all those extra details just to give us it's a gift um, to us and to Harry um, but yes um, I like that I actually like that the movie establishes R.A.B. as something that Ron noticed yeah Rupert Grant is great and he gets a lot more to do in the last two movies mm-hmm. 
um, than even book Ron does. Not that book Ron doesn't have a lot of, he makes a lot of good points and um, he's the one that says the trace shouldn't be there. And later they established that Ron was right. Um, but yeah, creature's tail. Um, you hate creature. And I feel like this actually finally ties a nice neat bow on spew mm -hmm. and i can't believe i'm saying that because i always said i've said in on this podcast that spew is a dumb storyline and i still kind of think it is but now we finally figured out um all of the where is it oh here it is harry doesn't understand how creature can get tortured by voldemort and then turn serious over to him harry creature doesn't think like that uh, said Hermione. He's a slave. House cells are used to bad, even brutal treatment. What Voldemort did to Creature wasn't that far out of the common way. What do wizard wars mean to an elf-like creature? He's loyal to people who are kind to him, and Mrs. Black must have been, and Regulus certainly was, so he served them willingly and parroted their beliefs. I know what you're going to say, she went on as Harry began to protest that Regulus changed his mind, but he doesn't seem to have explained that to Creature, has he? And I think I know why. Creatures and Regulus' family were all safer if they kept to the old pure blood line. And then talks about how Sirius was horrible to Creature. Um, I've said all along that wizards would pay for how they treat house elves. Well, Voldemort did, and so did Sirius. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was definitely a whoa. Just talk about moment. a bomb. And that yeah. finally kind of pulls it all together. And Harry even remembers what Dumbledore said to him. I do not think Sirius ever saw Creature was a being with feelings as acute as a human's. And just like so many things in this book, Voldemort underestimates power of things that he thinks are beneath him. And his his um, his end is because of those things. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's what I love about the difference between Voldemort and Grindelwald. Is Grindelwald has different. Um, motivations and his in fact he even has like a sentimental place uh yeah. after he's imprisoned and he kind of goes good in the end and that's why voldemort struggles to get the the truth of the elder wand out from him right which the movie one just tells him where it is but it's fine Um, oh, I love this. Harry's being nice to Creature. And mm -hmm. then he decides to give him the locket and Ron's like, overkill. Oh, overkill, mate. <laughs> and Creature cries for half an hour. Um, Poor guy. <laughs> I know. Oh. That, that little elf needed some love. I know. Or at least affection of some sort. Care. And I know this is next chapter, and we're not going to talk about it. But in the book, this picture for the bribe, that is not Remus Lupin. No. Who that looks like? Um, that's some the really. Who's the really, really old guy? Old man. That looks like oh, Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Flamel. Flamel. <laughs> that looks like the movie Nicholas Flamel. It really does. Um, but gosh, Creature's Tale. Um, I think is it a? I, uh, I don't want to say it. I have had another twist of opinion about Severus Snape. I was listening to the chapter about him when I first read the book. Now I'm reading again. And my brain was, I was just like, that dog. I should have been saying that about Sirius, but I was saying it about Snape. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, he's so great. He's so cool. His character is just very complex. He's just and... cold as ice all the time. Um, so yeah. much composure. That's just such a value. So I was going to say R.A.B. is my favorite Slytherin, but he's just not. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think a Slughorn is either because of book Slughorn. It's mm. probably still Snape. Mm. And yeah. Jim and, and, and movie Slughorn. 100% Jim right. Broadbent. <laughs> ah, any final thoughts? There was just so creature. much to unpack from that section 
I think, but I think so we're really starting to get that, into the meat of this book. Yeah, I think it's so insane that Regulus drank the potion. Yeah, and he died. could have made creature do it, but he didn't. Yes, but also I think he knew he was going to die anyway. Yeah, and he would rather I don't know die such a horrible by death. his own terms than. And I I I actually really like how they not just through Hermione's explanation that I read for the podcast, but they explain through creatures kind of responses, how Harry keeps asking him how he got away and creature can't really say anything, but master Regulus asked me to come home. Harry's but, but how? And then Ron's like, well, obviously he disapparated like elves. Elf magic is different from ours. Ron said that though. Not who mm-hmm. I am. Right. Ron. This book's so great. Um, I will say we're getting into the meat, but we also get into uh, tents in the forest, too. Yes. And that's a very boring section. That is very true. For everyone. It's and like the how movie I feel at least during the, the, yeah. the Hobbit. <clears throat> They're just trekking along for so long. You mean the whole book? Got him. Got him. <laughs> I have never successfully read the entirety of The Hobbit. Yeah. Because uh, I get through three fourths of it and I'm like, good God. This book how never actually more? gets anywhere. Yeah. How much more? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the movies. I've played the incredible uh, PlayStation 1 slash computer game, but mm-hmm. I can't do the book. I can't do it. I'm going to try. Uh, I'm going to try Fellowship of the Ring instead. Yeah. Fun fact Andy Serkis has made reading them more interesting so i'm gonna give him a go for lord of the rings yeah i i remember trying lord of the rings like a few years ago and really struggled and i'm wondering because i also really struggled with the hobbit i don't often listen to audiobooks but i have highly considered that when i go to do lord of the rings that i'll listen to andy circus i think andy circus has figured out jared tolkien's voice in a way that my brain just cannot yeah like he'll say those, you know, they he always talks about something and then I'll do a comma and then I'll talk about a bunch of details about the person and then I'll finish the sentence. So when Andy Circus is talking, he's like, now Bilbo Baggins said this. And of course, blah, 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 blah. and then he goes back to it. Like he says that Pete really fast. And I'm uh-huh. like, I think that's how J.R. Tolkien actually wanted us to read that. <laughs> this YouTube. It agreed with Pretty you. <laughs> it's alive. Um, really this is a fun fact to end the episode with for you, Abby, because Tim and Cole didn't appreciate this like I thought I would. Do you know who read the Hunger Games audiobooks? Who? Tatiana Mislani, pre She Hulk. Really? She Hulk herself read the Hunger Games audiobooks, and I've what? never listened to them, but I'm about to. And I'm, I checked it, I put it on hold at the library. I'm very excited. Um, I found out audiobooks read by actors is the way to go. They're always fun. Yep. Except for Jim Dale. Jim Dale's the best. It cannot be replaced. <laughs> Not even by Stephen Fry. There's a Star Wars audiobook reader that Cody I need to try those. That Cody really likes. And I'm like, I'd really I'm really interested to hear David's thoughts on who the best audiobook. I feel like he would say Jim Dale. But I'm curious to know his thoughts on like Star Wars narrators and see if he thinks there's one that's better than Jim Dale or if Jim Dale's just the goat. I'm pretty sure he'll say Jim Dale's the goat, but I think it depends on the universe. You know, I don't think I that's apples to oranges. Like I really you think that. Well, I just think just Jim on... Dale is the best Harry Potter one, but yeah. maybe I don't know if he's the best audiobook narrator of all time. I really like the Aragon um audiobook reader as well like see maybe because i don't listen and he does all the right pronunciations Fair. whereas me reading the books by myself like i read with the audiobooks for aragon and that helps me understand all the pronunciations oh, yeah. um and i think maybe because i don't reader. listen to very many audiobooks i just kind of assumed in my head that like even if they were different worlds or like fandoms that I don't know. There would be one reader who's different or 
like that's better than another. I think they add overall. inflections, and I also think Jim Dale's came out later, and so he has the added benefit of the movies. That's fair. In hindsight, whereas some of the other ones, um, some of the other audiobook readers just don't. Yeah. And so I think they have, I think they have some more pros just because they don't have anything to lean on. Yeah. And Andy Circus does new voices too, except for Gollum. Anyway, uh, what a fun side trail on <laughs> audiobook readers to finish the podcast. But I hope you enjoyed this section of Deathly Hallows. Um, we're going to be doing chapters 11 through 15 on the next episode. I hope you have a wonderful time with um, David, Abby, Cole, whoever's here. Um, and we'll all convene after that. Um, we're having a great time just finishing out this last book. And I really hope that you're enjoying it with us. Please like. I'm back. All right. Um, but we'll see you next time as a podcast. Um, on behalf of Abby and myself, Mischief Merit. Miss now. I can't <laughs> must talk too much this episode. I knew this would happen to me one day, Abby. Mischief managed mischief by the marriage. Hufflepuff. Mischief marriage. <laughs> we just had a wedding in this episode. It's oh fine. Gosh.